When I first sat down with today's storyteller, she told me that to know my story is to know my heritage. It's so easy to forget that the ripple effects of trauma reach beyond our present moments. They affect not only the immediate future, but also generations who follow. Today, we get to talk with Joanna Candell. Hi there, my name is Joanna Candell. I am the CEO and founder of the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness. We're gonna see how the interplay of genetics and the life experience of your parents play into the development of an eating disorder and what you can do to change the tide. We'll also cover some helpful steps to getting a diagnosis, even if your regular physician is not familiar with eating disorders. You're listening to Mental Note Podcast. I'm Ellie Pike. Whenever I am asked to share my story, I always bring it back to um, my parents because so much of what they experienced in their life had such significance on my life. My father is actually a Holocaust survivor. He was born and raised in Paris. He was in a Jewish ghetto and at the age of three when the Germans um, came into the ghetto to round up the Jews to take them to the concentration camps, my grandmother, uh, my father, and my uncle narrowly slipped away and were able to go into hiding. My father was separated from his mom and for the next uh, six years actually lived on a farm in the outskirts of Paris and was really left to his own accord to be uh, to take care of himself truthfully. Joanna's father wouldn't see his family again until after World War II had passed and when he did finally see them there weren't many left. His father and Pretty much everybody besides his mother and uh, his brother were killed in Auschwitz. When you turn it over to my mom, uh, she was uh, also born and raised in Europe, but she was born into a very, very poor family. There were about 13 of them that lived in a studio apartment and they didn't even have running water. So eating once a day was actually a really, really good day. The aftermath of these traumas affected Joanna in very tangible ways. Would you say it it caused you to be more approval-seeking and seeking affection specifically? Oh my goodness, without a doubt. His trauma, what he experienced, absolutely shaped my growth, my childhood, my, my lifetime experience. I know personally, I spent so much time trying to be good enough so that I would hear, you know, from my dad that that he loved me or that he was proud of me, which wasn't anything that he was capable of. So how did that affect who you actually became personality wise and what your temperament really was long term? Sure. So, you know, we know that so much of personality and temperament can be genetic. And, you know, my dad has always struggled with with OCD, with perfectionism. My dad has one sister and she struggled with anorexia. My mother had three sisters and three brothers, and two out of our three sisters struggled with bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa. We all know, right, that that genetics are not the only thing that contribute to the development of eating disorders. It's the temperament, which I had, you know, the black or white, all or nothing, that people pleaser, the um, existence of comorbid psychiatric illness. So I had, you know, anxiety. I've also struggled with depression. And the last thing, which was really the environment trigger pull for me, was when I started walking, I walked pigeon-toed. And my, my my parents thought it would be a really good thing to put me in ballet because it would turn my feet out, it would give me poise. And much to their chagrin, I absolutely fell in love with ballet. By the time I was seven, I was dancing four days a week. And by the time I was 10, I was spending my summers in New York at prestigious academies like School of American Ballet. And so my world very quickly shifted to, you know, being the best ballet dancer I can be. And, you know, the saying, the path to hell is filled with good intentions. That is exactly my journey summarized. So I remember going home and looking at my mom and saying, mom, I'm going to go on a healthy food diet. And that's really what it was, that I was going to eat healthier, right? Fruits and vegetables. And my mom, you know, having this child who hated vegetables and hated fruit was 
actually said, hallelujah, you know, my kid's going to eat, you know, these vegetables. Um, And there was a lot of pressure in my ballet class of you need to lose weight, you need to lose weight. And about two months later when we auditioned, unfortunately, I was the only one out of the 15 girls that um, didn't get cast. And they, you know, they pulled me aside and they said, you know, Joanna, the reason why you didn't get picked is not because you're not a great dancer. On the contrary, it's just that you look so young. And I have to tell you, in that moment was the first time that I ever experienced that nasty game of telephone that so many people with eating disorders experience. And what do you mean by that? So often somebody will say something and what the eating disorder does is it twists it almost for their own agenda, right? So, you know, someone can say, oh, you look so healthy. And what I probably would have heard when I was struggling was, oh, they called me fat. To summarize, to piece it together, tell me if I'm correct, you had genetics going against you because you weren't even raised necessarily around your your mom's um, sisters that had eating disorders. And so it wasn't the nurture piece, but the nature piece there. And then you had your own tendencies towards perfectionism, black and white thinking. And then you had the cultural piece of your dance teacher saying you should lose weight. So I think that that is you know, so important to point out that never was this a choice. It just sort of evolved into the way that your brain worked. Is that correct? So right on, you know, and it's so important because people don't realize the whole um, perfect storm that that comes together. I never chose this. Like I would have never chosen to struggle with cancer or any other physical illness. But I think that there's this misnomer out there that because you know, when it comes to mental illness, because it's above the neck, we should be able to fix it and we should be able to avoid it. That couldn't be further from the truth. I also think that the feedback that I got surrounding my appearance at the beginning was a big, a big propeller. And honestly, it came down to it became so safe and it became so second nature and so habitual that I really couldn't even imagine my life without it. In the process of the eating disorder being in control, when you look back, did you notice like actually not being in control of your life or your relationships being affected or, you know, your performance in any way? I think of how many relationships that I no longer have because of my eating disorder. I think of how many times I put my my health, my well-being, my mental health in jeopardy because of my eating disorder. If I would have been in control, I would have never made those choices. I I think that's a really important distinction. So can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, in the midst of this, it's functioning for you. It's helping you in some sort of way, coping with your anxiety, functioning in life, but also in in the grand scheme, it was, it was maladaptive. It was not helpful in the grand scheme. In the meantime, did anyone know that you had an eating disorder? My eating disorder started the summer between my sixth and seventh grade year of school. Truthfully, for a, a good solid two years, Everybody was very much in the very complimentary stage. Oh, you look great. Have you lost weight? And of course, my eating disorder fed right into that, excuse that terminology. But there was a shift right around ninth grade where people's tones, you know, went from, oh, you look great. Have you lost weight? How did you do it? To, oh my God, are you okay? Are you feeling okay? And it was interesting because the only two people that really didn't say much at all about my my weight and my eating disorder were my parents. And I was always very careful to leave the door closed when I was changing. But at that point, I'd become so foggy brained and honestly so exhausted from struggling for so long that I left the door open and I was changing. And just at that moment, my mom happened to walk by and she looked in. And I think for the first time, In about five and a half years, she saw what I looked like without clothes on. She pushed the door open and started screaming and was shaking me, not badly, but just, you know, saying, oh my God, you're going to die, you're going to die. And in that moment, I remember having this, a little bit of relief that she knew. And at the same time, so much more fear that she was going to take it away. And so she was shocked. She she had no idea it had developed to this point. Exactly right. So, 
you know, the next morning she took me to the doctor and um, he put me on, on the scale and looked at my mom and said, you know, she's very, very thin. However, just go home, feed her some good French food and she will be fine. Do you remember what you felt at that moment? So much relief that I was going under the radar. And then truthfully, I felt like, well, you see, there's nothing really wrong, right? Like I'm not sick enough. And truth be told, I knew what eating disorders were at the time. I knew very well I was struggling with anorexia. So so you get away with it, essentially, and, and your doctor lets you go. And what happened right after that? So three days later, I ended up in the, in the ER, and they uh, moved me to the cardiac care unit because my heart rate was so low, they didn't think that my heart was going to make it through the night, unfortunately. Which is a side effect of eating disorder. Long term. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. And the thing that I have to tell you just makes everything so much more like, or I should say has fueled my work so much at the Alliance is nobody in the entire time I was in the hospital said anything about anorexia nervosa. So it would have been prime time for intervention and actually treatment. I could have actually had access to care. But I left and they're only, they, they stabilized my heart and their only concern was they diagnosed me with malnutrition and with the fact that I was 17 and a half years old and I had never menstruated. Their solution was, well, we need to get her menstruating. So they decided to quote unquote, fix me with medicine. So they gave me hormones and they also give me steroids. Taking these meds caused Joanna to gain weight which only propelled her deeper into her disordered eating. I, at that point, was when I shifted from restricting to binging and purging because I thought, you know what, heck, if my body's going to be doing this anyways, I might as well start engaging in these behaviors. My mom came up to see my first performance, and at that point, she was starting to, you know, sort of mill around the word eating disorders and she had talked to my doctor and he finally acknowledged that yes I probably had an eating disorder and so between my doctor and my my family they decided that the best thing that I could do for my quote-unquote recovery was to stop dancing. For me ballet was my world. It was my heart, it was my soul, it was why I woke up every morning, it was the only thing I ever wanted to do. It was, number one is, it was the biggest loss I'd ever felt in my life. But more than anything, I realized that I had lived my life for the last definitely six years at that point, almost seven, having two identities, Joanna the dancer, and then Joanna, the eating disordered person. And so when you took out the, the, the dancer, um, the um, dancer identity, all I was left with was my eating disorder. And do you think that that was directly correlated with not dancing anymore and not having to hold a certain shape and allowing yourself to eat again? Without a doubt. Yeah. So then it fell out of control, but then it also had a side effect of numbing all your feelings. Oh my goodness, absolutely. You know, and then I remember, you know, setting myself up all the time, also at the same time, meaning I would gauge in, in these these behaviors where, you know, like I know factually, like through the work that I do now is the number one behavior that leads to binging is restricting. So I would have these cycles of restricting and binging and restricting and binging. I remember thinking, who am I? Because for so long I was Joanna the, the 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 dancer. And so going back to that identity of the eating disorder, I remember thinking the only thing I know about just as much as I know about ballet is eating disorders. So it was in that moment that I really had this, I don't want to say epiphany, but this moment of discovery where I was like, if I ever get better, what I really want to do is help other people because I struggled for so long in silence. I struggled with isolation and loneliness and feeling like I was the exception to the rule. And more than anything, not feeling that I deserved anything. Like I feel like I didn't even deserve to take up space. Truthfully, 
I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I had struggled for 10 years in the hell that was my, my disease. I was tired of not showing up even though I was showing up. I was tired of not laughing or building these walls that were so tall because I was so afraid of letting anybody in and yet looking around and seeing how isolated I was. So I called my parents and I said, you know, mom, dad, I need help. That was when my journey to recovery started. Joanna's desire to recover was so strong that it took root despite discouragement from her first treatment team that had no idea what they were doing. The first therapist that I went to go see for help for my eating disorder was actually not an eating disorder specialist. And she was very lovely. And I shared with her some of my story and she looked at me and she said, Joanna, I'm really proud of you for being here, but I need you to know that eating disorders are very similar to substance use, that once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. And so once you have your eating disorder, you'll always have your eating disorder. And I have to tell you that absolutely was probably the worst thing she could have ever said to me because I remember looking at her and saying, well, then why am I here? And what I needed her to say truthfully was it gets better. I don't think I was prepared to hear the word recovered, but I needed someone to say it gets better. And so I left her office and it just gave me, you know, carte blanche to keep on doing all the stuff I was doing, act out in all the shenanigans I was doing. And it wasn't until several weeks later that I once again had this moment of almost like peeking to see if, you know, recovery was something that I could try. And I found finally a therapist that had had knowledge on eating disorders. And of course, that's that's where the actual work started. To talk about that actual work, we tracked down Dr. Joanne Hindelman, a clinical director with over 45 years experience in the field. I am Dr. Joanne Hendelman, and I am clinical director of the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness and the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness Psychological Services. She also happened to be the chief psychologist at the hospital where Joanna was initially admitted. But because of misdiagnosis, they never met until years later. Through her work, she is keenly aware of why it can be so difficult to get an eating disorder diagnosis in the first place. Wow. When I started out in 1973, yes, that long ago, it took me about a week to read everything that was out there about eating disorders. So it took many years for more information to start coming out till now. There's just no way I can keep up. You worked at the hospital where Joanna went in when she needed help, and she was not diagnosed with an eating disorder at the time. And you, you might not have ever interacted with her, but just kind of what's your take on that, where people went so undiagnosed because there was lack of education, lack of awareness? The sad part is that the lack of awareness continues till today. Um, years ago, when Joanna first went to the hospital at the time, I was the department chair for psychology, and yet the information out there was very limited. And unfortunately, that's true in a lot of places today, especially in hospitals where they are not special, specializing in eating disorders. So they're not really aware of what to pick up. They're not really aware of what signs and symptoms they want to hear, not only from the patient, but even the patient's family. Right. So if you were to educate our audience or even professionals in the field, what are some of the warning signs that you would ask them to look out for? There are things that are subtle. There are things that are significant. What's interesting is that the person with an eating disorder is unlikely to come into the doctor by choice for their eating disorder. They basically come to the doctor because they have stomach aches, they have constipation, headaches, loss of energy, difficulty keeping up with their exercise regimen that they have always maintained, sleep issues, or dry skin. Those are the kinds of things that are going to come into the doctor for. 
their eating disorder in their mind is their only way of maintaining control over their bodies. You know, I think that you really do bring up a great point. No one's really going to come into the doctor saying, hey, I, I'm doing all of these things. Would you please diagnose me with an eating disorder? It's always going to go underlying and the eating disorder is always telling the person to protect it, right? It's It's a coping mechanism. It's a way of survival in essence. So I think you do, you speak a lot to just how we have to kind of read between the lines as medical professionals and how we also have a lot of work to do in this field to to raise awareness. Yes. When you think of the fact that only 19% of medical centers actually have an elective course about eating disorders, And then they may not even get the information in their residencies. We did a presentation for first year residents from a local medical school. We asked them about the information that they received about eating disorders. Not only did they not get very much, but it was all out of date. Wow. And it it was frightening. That is extremely concerning. And I imagine that that breeds a feeling of fear if if there's this whole topic, you know, of eating disorders that someone doesn't know how to treat. I imagine there's this fear in being able to even diagnose it correctly or knowing how to treat it if you did diagnose it. Unfortunately, we have a real problem with many doctors when we start talking about, for example, binge eating disorder, that they still have the belief system that shame is the way to change the patient's behavior. They're not diagnosing binge eating disorder. What they're doing is saying you're too fat and therefore you need to lose weight because medically it's not okay. And the utilization of shame is frightening. Yes. And I think the other side of it too, you could probably speak to someone who's exercising and, you know, wanting to eat quote unquote healthy or really clean. You could probably have a lot of medical providers really praising them for their discipline, for trying to be healthy and not really recognize that they're, you know, urging on this you know, demon of an eating disorder. Uh, The next topic I wanted to ask you about is about using the traits of an eating disorder. So we've talked about um, with Joanna, like perfectionism, high achieving, people pleasing tendencies, right? And using those traits for good instead of destruction. And so I'm kind of curious just what your take is on that and also how you've seen that in Joanna's life. When we have patients who have obsessive compulsive personality, we actually can help them to utilize that for their own good, for their health, to be able to maintain their lives in a fashion that is comfortable for them without it taking over their lives, without it getting in the way of life. And that's really where it comes down to it. When we think about orthorexia nervosa and the um, obsessive compulsive nature of eating clean and eating only certain foods, perhaps being a raw foodie, whatever it is, yes, it's fine for us to have a plan in terms of maintaining the health of our body. We, We sort of call it body supportive instead of healthy because healthy becomes obsessive compulsive, whereas body supportive allows you to be flexible with your body, allows you to go out of the boundaries on occasion, and that's okay. With uh, Joanna, the obsessive compulsive got in her way in terms of her dance to the point where she wanted to be the perfect ballerina to be incredibly successful that transferred over to be the perfect person with anorexia nervosa. And now Joanna is able to utilize her need for being healthy and taking care of things in a way of getting things done without abusing herself, being nasty to herself, being self-shaming if she can't get something done that needs to get done. 
right? So using some of those perfectionistic tendencies to, yes, get something done, work for a cause, but then at the same time, learning flexibility and, you know, balance with some of those tendencies and traits. Exactly. And Dr. Hindelman was right. The amazing thing about Joanna is that she took the personality traits that fueled her eating disorder and turned them against the disease. Recovery, and this is the truth, is the hardest thing I ever did. It's messy, it's painful, and at the same time, I can tell you, it is the best thing that I ever did. I really approached my recovery the same way that I approached my eating disorder. Black or white, all or nothing. I thought that when I chose to recover, I would recover. That I would be able to sit in front of a a plate of food and be okay. That the constant body checking or the constant obsessive and compulsive thoughts would just go away. Clearly, that is absolutely not what happened. Because although my perception of what recovery was, was a linear line, The truth of the matter, the journey to recovery is messy. It's one step forward, three steps back, two steps forward, four steps back. To allow yourself to trip and fall, I bet was really challenging for you, especially as an achiever, a perfectionist, someone who's able to do things at her own will. What made you keep choosing recovery even when it sucked? You know, at times it was my family. At times it was, you know, my desire to help others, whatever inspiration I could pull from, because truthfully at the beginning, it wasn't for me and it wasn't about me. It was for so many other people. Recovery happens in those moments where you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off and you keep on moving forward. And the beauty of it is you're not meant to do this alone. Just how like someone that has diabetes isn't expected to will their blood sugars to regulate, someone with an eating disorder is not expected to fix this on their own. You are not a failure for not being able to recover on your own, even though, you know, the garbage that our that our eating disorder tells us fits right into that. So will you tell us a little bit about the Alliance for Eating Disorders? As I started to recover, what I realized was what made my heart sing was to be able to talk to that seventh grade me who felt like I didn't deserve or didn't deserve to take up space. So I called up my parents and I said, you know, mom, dad, I want to start a nonprofit organization. And I had some nonprofit experience because I worked for another eating disorder nonprofit at the time. And they basically said, well, you got into, you know, grad school, you got into some PhD programs. And I said, let me defer for a year and see if I can make this work. So I actually took out a student loan my, my last semester of college. I moved back home to South Florida and I filed the paperwork to start the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness in October of 2000. At the beginning, I worked three jobs to keep the organization going, but this October will be 18 years that were in existence. We do outreach, education, early intervention, and advocacy for all eating disorders. So we do everything from connecting people to treatment, to going into schools and educating people about eating disorders. Our top three pillars at the Alliance really stem from the experiences I had in my struggle, meaning uh, first and foremost, we do a lot of work around the country educating primary care providers on how to identify, assess, and refer people to treatment. And then the other things that that we do here is we offer free clinician-led weekly support groups. We have a bunch of them in South Florida, but towards the end of this year, we're expanding to eight cities across the country. That's amazing. And we also help people find treatment, all levels of care from outpatient to acute medical stabilization. And last, we do a whole lot of advocacy around eating disorders. So the one thing that, that has really shifted my life was the first time that I went to Washington, D.C. about 16 and a half years ago, and I was sitting in front of my congressman, and I had no idea why I was there. I just, I showed up, I was like, I think it's a good idea to go talk to your member of Congress, sure. And he looked at me and he said, you know, why are you here? And I'm like, I don't know. (laughs) And he said, well, tell me about yourself. And I started sharing my story about my struggle and my recovery. 
and the fact that, you know, 30 million Americans will experience an eating disorder and that they don't discriminate and that only one in three people with eating disorders gets access to care. And the most unbelievable thing happened is he he sat there and he listened to me and then he started to ask questions and he sent follow-up emails and became involved. And that was really the turning point for me where I realized that every voice matters and people with eating disorders deserve to be seen and to be heard. Joanna's steadfast belief that nobody can do this alone prompted her to not only find the help she needed, but to also fulfill her long-held dream of helping others to find their way out. She opened the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness in the fall of 2000. They provide programs and activities aimed at outreach, education, early intervention, and advocacy for all eating disorders. She is truly living out her dreams. As a whole, I think our field is getting better, but we need to do a better job that recovery from eating disorders is possible. Because when my best friend was diagnosed with breast cancer eight years ago, seven years ago now, pretty significant breast cancer, I remember her getting off the phone and looking at me. And I remember thinking, well, you're going to recover because, you know, October, everything is pink and there's so many survivor stories. We need to do that in the eating disorder world. So I'm so happy that there's so many advocates out there now that are using their voice. I love what you say too, that every voice matters and you learned that through your personal experience. Thank you so much. And we will definitely link to the Eating Disorders Coalition and the Alliance for Eating Disorders on our website, mentalnotepodcast.com. I'm just so grateful to have had your story shared, and I'm excited for people to be able to follow you and get involved. Thanks for sharing your story every day. Thank you so much for having me on. Joanna performed the incredible work of taking generational trauma and reversing it. She now stands in the gap between other people's suffering and a future of healing that will affect generations after them. You can also be a part of the dramatic change that Joanna and others have dedicated themselves to. There's so many ways to become an advocate. First and foremost, I would absolutely check with your treatment team to see where you are as far as your ability. And there are so many other ways besides, you know, speaking to be an advocate. For example, the Eating Disorders Coalition does action alerts every so often. So go on and register to get action alerts where you can call your member of Congress or send an email. You can write blogs. All of that stuff matters because you're creating conversation and every time we talk about eating disorders, we're, we're smashing the stigma around it. We're launching a brand new site. And we're looking for people to write blogs for us if they're interested or join us on Capitol Hill twice a year when, when we do Hill Day with the coalition. There's so many ways to become involved and people deserve to hear you and people deserve to see you. By familiarizing yourself with signs and symptoms of eating disorders, talking with your physician if you think you or a loved one might be struggling, Or better yet, accessing resources like the Alliance for Eating Disorders at allianceforeatingdisorders.com or Eating Recovery Center at eatingrecovery.com. Both offer free information and resource libraries to help you on your journey. To learn more behind the scenes about each of our podcast guests, visit our website, mentalnotepodcast.com. Mental Note is sponsored by Eating Recovery Center and Insight Behavioral Health Centers. To talk to a licensed counselor and see if treatment is a good idea for you, call 877-411-9578. I'm Ellie Pike. Till next time.